and welcome to Court TV Live. I'm Chanley Painter in for Julie Grant this afternoon. Thank you for being with us. It's a big day in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Closing arguments in the Theodore Edgecombe trial just underway. Let's go back inside court where the prosecutor, Paul Hubner, is delivering those closing arguments for the prosecution. The bike towards those stairs are, and then he stops. And ladies and gentlemen, you saw, yes, the victim starts off with that purposeful walk that several witnesses saw. And then, yes, even though some of them don't remember it, he got into that little bit of a jog. And he gets there and he squares up with the defendant. He's there, ladies and gentlemen, as Jose Perez and Jeff Parr told you, it looked like he was going to confront them. His, vid, the, his wife even said to the police at the time, yes, she said he was going to talk to him. She told the police he was going to confront him. Confronting could mean yelling at him, asking him a question. Could be meaning to fight him. Could be doing exactly what Rod Trail Cameron said he was going to do, which was get in that boxer stance. He was going to punch the man, according to Rod Trail Cameron, that had punched him. The defendant threw a punch, and then when that person was getting ready to punch back, According to Rod Trail Cameron and Jeffrey Parr and Jose Perez and the victim's wife, he pulls a gun, aims it at the victim's head, and pulls the trigger. Victim drops. So cold blooded. Rod Trail Cameron is on 911 saying, You gotta get here. He's still here. When he talks to the police, dude's gotta go. That was too cold-blooded. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when Jason, the victim, gets there, he has nothing in his hand. Nothing. No weapon. There's no evidence under any circumstances, under any view of anything that has been brought into this case to believe that he had a weapon in his hand. Defense counsel made a very big, very big point over the fact that they were going to have a witness that came in and said that somehow the wife was going through his pockets and they were insinuating as though she was somehow putting the knife in. That also came during for what seemed like one of the weirdest sidetracks where the defense was attempting to debate whether or not she even loved her husband. Remember that? A wife that purported to love his husband? Oh my God, she asks, is he a right? She's so calm. We're spending all this time when the video that everybody knows about shows her in the back of the squad when the shock begins to fall off and the tears start coming and she goes, oh my God, my love. No one will love you like me, my love. She is heartbroken. She held it together as long as she could. Maybe you don't... Maybe you wouldn't have reacted that way. Maybe defense counsel wouldn't have reacted that way. But to question whether or not a woman who saw her husband's brains blown out of his head in front of her even loves her husband because of some tone is disgusting. And then we get this thing of, yes, she's somehow trying to secret the knife. That makes no sense. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, she told you she went there, she wanted something, she grabbed his wallet. How do we know that? Because the video showed you. She goes to the cops, I've got his wallet. We know what she was doing. She grabbed his wallet. Does it make sense? I, I don't know what I would do if my wife's brains were blown out in front of me. No one knows. Defense counsel questions that and makes it seem like somehow she's trying to take this knife and put it in his pocket. Ladies and gentlemen, in order for that to be true, Miss Clearman, at that moment in time, would have had to realize, I gotta take this knife out of his hand. Uh, um, you know what, instead of throwing it over the wall or putting it in the car or putting it in my purse, I'm gonna put it in his pocket. And then, in order for someone to realize, you know, because there's people around, maybe they see me going to his pocket, I'm gonna take his wallet so that I've got a ready excuse. That's the, more to, the amount of thinking that they're expecting Ms. Clearman to have. And they're forgetting one thing, ladies and gentlemen. When he got punched, Mr. Clearman puts his hand up, remember? And he says to his wife, I'm bleeding. That hand, that right hand, has got blood all on the palm. That right hand, that when he touches, mere touches 
the car door in order to open and close it leaves blood on the, ha on the, the wall of the door and on the window. So much blood, ladies and gentlemen, that it's literally visible on the car. That bloody hand, in order for defense counsel's point to make any sense, would have had to gone into this pristine pocket by these pants, leaving no blood on the knife or on the pocket or anywhere. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Mr. Clearman. Gordon Rottrell came and gets into a boxing stance, and Rottrell said, I just would have boxed him. But the defendant pulls his firearm, he aims it, he puts one right above his eyes, right above the eyebrow, into the victim's brain, which causes him to drop a fatal wound. And keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, what the Emmy told you about that. Slightly upward. Slightly upward. Front to back, no left to right deviation. It's a straight on shot, just like all four witnesses described. Raising his hand with a gun in the hand, because when someone's got a weapon in their hand, you, you know what it is. You see it. You see that weapon. Four people saw that gun in his hand. Not because it's down by the side and, oh, there's a lot item or it. They saw the gun because that was the threat and that was the weapon. And Mr. Clearman takes that bullet into the brain. And what does the defendant do after that, ladies and gentlemen? He runs. He takes off. Instead of taking the direct street there, he ends up taking a bike path in which police would not be able to be driving down. He takes the most obscure way to get to his house where he can't be found or seen by individuals. He gets into the house and he ditches. What does he ditch? The bike. The first thing, the main thing that everyone's saying about who he is, is the bicyclist. He gets rid of the bike and then he walks and he goes and all we know is he never comes back. The gun that he used, according to him, he just throws it out the window because he you know, doesn't want someone to shoot him with it. Something that meant that he kept on to it, held on to this murder weapon for weeks through two states until all of a sudden he hits the cornfields of Indiana as though some voice comes out and says, if you ditch it, they won't find you. No, ladies and gentlemen, he's getting rid of the gun two states away because he's trying to avoid getting caught. That's why he dyes his hair. That's why he goes on the run. That's why he says he's from the Bahamas and tries every last ditch he can to not be held responsible. And when they come down, he plays dumb in the hopes that we won't be able to put it together on him. And then, ladies and gentlemen, it's all, oh, the victim must have had a knife. And when that falls apart because their witness doesn't see anything in the wife's hands and there's no evidence to support he had anything, not one single witness supports that, all of a sudden, at the 11th hour, we go from, yep, I was defending myself to it's an accident. He tried to get away. He tried to lie. He tried to play dumb. He tried to say the victim was doing something. And now it's just an accident. Now, ladies and gentlemen, those are the facts. And now you need to consider them in terms of the law. The first count you consider, ladies and gentlemen, is first degree intentional homicide. The counts and elements are fairly simple. First, did he cause the death of the victim? Clearly he did. He shot him in the head. He falls down almost immediately. It's a mortal injury. It's a substantial factor. The defendant, under all circumstances, is the cause of the victim's death. Did he act with intent to kill? He raises his arm, according to four people, and shoots the victim in the face. The gunshot, front to back, slightly upward. That's not consistent with anything the defendant testified to, but it is consistent with four witnesses and video that show him with his arm and the victim goes down. And intent to kill means this, and this is very important. Practically certain to cause death. 
that the defendant knew that when he shot the victim, it was practically certain to cause death. He told you he's got weapons training with all his maritime security. He's gone to the range. He's been taught on how to hit what he shoots at. Well, he did. And when you shoot and aim at someone's head, that is practically certain. He knew that. That is intent to kill, ladies and gentlemen. That is intent to kill. And now we get to how self-defense factors in. The third element of intentional homicide is that the defendant did not actually believe that the force was necessary. Did not actually believe. But this only comes into play if you don't believe he provoked the attack. A person who engages in conduct likely to provoke an attack and who provokes an attack is not allowed to use force against the attack. However, as defense counsel will tell you and as the law says, if he withdraws and he makes it abundantly clear, he can regain that ability. But keep that in mind about actually believing the force was necessary. He is confronted with a man that he punched in the face. That man has no weapon. He has a gun. He withdraws it, and he shoots him in the head. He started a fist fight, and then he brought a gun to it. He started a fist fight, and he brought a gun to it. That's what happened, and that's what he did. He did not actually believe he had to shoot the victim in the face. When the victim said words, he punched him. When the victim gets ready for a fight, he kills him. Every escalation of the violence in this case has come from the defendant. Every time. There is no weapon in the victim's hands. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if, for whatever reason, you believe that the defendant did actually believe the force was necessary and did actually believe that he was acting in self-defense and that there was a threat of unlawful interference. All right, we have to step aside for a quick break, but don't worry, we'll take you back inside the courtroom for closing arguments from the prosecution in the trial against Theodore Edgecombe. You're watching Court TV. Welcome back. Prosecutor, Prosecutor Grant Hubner is in closing arguments against Theodore Edgecombe, painting him as a cold-blooded killer who started a fistfight and then brought a gun to the fight. Let's go back in right where we left off. Other than his incredible testimony, then ladies and gentlemen, you go to the next question, which is second degree intentional. Again, he caused the death intent to kill. There's no doubt about that. But then we get to do not whether or not the defendant did not reasonably believe that the force was necessary. And if any one of these three apply, any one of them apply, then the defendant is guilty of second degree intentional. A reasonable person would not believe he was preventing or terminating an off of interference. He punches the victim and then shoots him. Keep in mind, this is someone who said he just couldn't let the victim get away. The next one is a reasonable person would not believe he was in danger of imminent death or great bodily harm. When he is looking at the victim, there is no visible we weapon. As Roger Cameron, Retro Cameron told you, he just pulls it and he just shot him in the head. Remember that. And the 911 call and to the police officer, he just shot him in the head. He just shot him in the head. And then he flees. And the last, ladies and gentlemen, is that a reasonable person would not have believed that the amount of force used was necessary. He brought a gun to a fist fight. He stunned it. That's not reasonable. If, for whatever reason, you do not believe that there is intent to kill, and you should, because under the law, as we've talked about, it's practically certain to cause death. His training, he knew it, he's been trained, he knows how to hit what he shoots at, and he did, and he did well, unfortunately, in this case. You get too reckless 
again cause the death, we know about that, but then we get into criminally reckless conduct. Did he create a risk of death or great bodily harm? He shot him in the face. Was that unreasonable? Did he know it was unreasonable and substantial? At a close range, when that individual, the victim, according to Mr. Cameron, according to other people, are just going to confront him, no weapons, no punches, no nothing, he pulls a gun and he shoots him, that is unreasonable. He knows what he's doing, he's been trained. And in this situation, ladies and gentlemen, when you get to reckless homicide, the actual and reasonable belief portions of, se of self-defense apply. It's not like an intentional where if, you know, he actually believes, but it's unreasonable, it's second degree intentional. In first degree and second degree reckless, if you find it to be unreasonable what he did and you should, then he's guilty of, of either one of those, depending on how you view the last, and this is important, the last element of reckless conduct, utter disregard for human life. And in this situation, ladies and gentlemen, you are told you'd consider the defendant's conduct after the incident. You shot a man in the face. That's utter disregard for human life. And the last one, ladies and gentlemen, homicide by negligence. This thing that comes out of nowhere after days of talking about how the defendant was forced out of self-defense to raise the gun and fire it, all of a sudden, after every other thing that has been tried has failed, we now get the gun was pointing down, all of a sudden the guy's spearing him, and it goes off. Except the Emmy and the witnesses show that that's not what happened. He doesn't get slightly upward front to back, no left to right deviation, except for in the way in which four people said it. Pulls the gun, without warning, without anything, and he just shot him in the head. Ladies and gentlemen, in the beginning, defense counsel came up and he said, you see my hand, do you see everything, do you see everything about my hand? Well, someone did see all portions of a hand. The defendant, the defendant saw the victim's hands. There was nothing in them. And he shot him. No weapon. Just a man who's confronting the defendant after the defendant punched him in the face. For that reason, ladies and gentlemen, he's guilty.